For our next conversation, we're gonna be talking about um, reimagining our, your local bodega with better food. Um, and so we are going to have um, Francisco Marte, who's the president of the Bodega and Small Business Group, Latoya Meters, who is co-founder and CEO of Collective Fair, um, and Chet Van Wert, who is associate research scientist at NYU Stern School of Business. Um, so I've been working with this group for um, about maybe a year and a half or so. We've been talking about how do we um, how do we re-envision re the food system in order to get healthy foods into the bodegas in the Bronx, especially starting in Hunts Point. Um, and so uh, maybe Chet, if you wanna get us started with giving an overview of the project. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, I would love to. Um, I am gonna share my screen if that works. All right, we'll skip that. Um, so I work for the Center for Sustainable Business at NYU. So I'm at the business school. Um, we may be, you know, the training school for all the bad guys, but um, there is a part of the school that is looking at how can we create a more equitable and sustainable and resilient economy in New York City. Um, one of the areas we looked at was food, uh, and um, eventually we developed the project that Kelly is referring to, which is a healthy bodega project in um, Hunts Point. Um, the partners are my school, NYU Stern School of Business, the Stein, NYU Steinhardt Food Studies Program, uh, the Bodega and Small Business Group that uh, Francisco Marte is the president of, uh, and Bronx Health Reach. Um, and Kelly is our key contact there. Um, we are engaging with a lot of community-based organizations. We were in Hunts Point on Saturday for a back-to-school event hosted by the Hunts Point Alliance for Children. And um, if Dr. Carter's still on, <laughs> I will just tell you, when we had the kids tasting a bunch of food that Latoya and Collective Fair um, had prepared, and there were a bunch of nine and 10 year old kids that were loving the mushroom hummus that, that we were offering. And I was blown away. So <clears throat> I'm very happy to see that. Um, so in this project that I mentioned of looking at New York City's economy and how we could create a more sustainable and equitable economy, we said, you know, what's up with, you know, food deserts with areas of the city where there's really no fresh food available. Um, what's going on there? And we looked at a whole history through the entire Bloomberg and de Blasio administrations where there are all kinds of initiatives to, to incentivize more supermarkets for green carts, more produce stands for farmers markets. There's been a lot of effort. And over the last 20 years, and we say, well, why, you know, why is this, this not, not working? I'm not saying it doesn't work at all, but, but what, why, is, why are there still, you know, one and a half to two million New Yorkers who don't really have appropriate uh, accessibility to healthy food? We ended up looking at bodegas. I was blown away to learn that New York City, depending on how you define it, has somewhere between 10 and 14,000 bodegas. <clears throat> Many don't offer the fresh food that we need, but they are there. And so we said, what's, what's up with that? Um, and we found that there were a lot of programs, both in New York City, um, hosted by our friends at City Harvest, um, and elsewhere, um, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., um, um, many other cities in the United States, then they've shown that if you put fresh produce and if you put healthy food in a bodega, people buy it. People like it. People change their diet. Um, the store owners like it. They feel better about their business. <clears throat> and yet, again, we don't see widespread lasting change. And we ask the question, why? And so we went through this process. We're, we're in a we're in an academic institution, so we started off by doing a literature review. We looked at everything that's been published about healthy food in 
small corner stores. Then we did a bunch of our own research. We talked to participants um, across the country in corner store, healthy corner store projects. Um, we, we, um, we did a working group over a six month period that Kelly was a part of um, with public sector people, lots of people from the administration, um, nonprofits, businesses, academics. Um, and then we started hon you know, zeroing in on a solution. The solution was there, there, there isn't a healthy food distribution channel that works for bodegas. It's that simple. Why not? Well, we looked at it. Um, and we began for forging a partnership to try to address this. And this is the NYU Bodega and Small Business Group and Bronx Health Reach Partnership. We're in the process right now of looking for funding. We're waiting for uh, feedback on some grant applications. We're looking for more um, funding sources. Um, but this is basically our view of the, the, the problem and the issue in the, in the food system is there's a missing link. The entire food system in the United States chases big bucks. They're chasing Costco, larger and larger supermarkets, Walmart. They're all after that, those big, big um, food retailers, the kind of food retailers that are never going to end up in the Bronx. They're just not. They don't work there. Um, and so the answer that you hear when you ask what's going on is, well, we can't afford to deliver to a bodega that's going to order $100 worth of stuff today. It's too, you know, can't make that work. And, you know, so then you go, oh, well, that makes sense. But here's the problem. Here's the, here's the insight. New York City's bodegas all collectively together are a, something like a 10 or $20 billion food channel. In New York City alone. Bodega's wholesale buying power. When Frank's, Frank's Bodega and all of his brethren and sisters' bodegas go out and buy food from the, from the distributors, they're spending something between six and $12 billion a year with wholesalers. So the idea that a bodega doesn't have the, the financial leverage, the buying power, to access healthy food and to access it at affordable prices is just simply wrong. To do it though, we have to do two things. And this is, this is what we are crafting our pilot around. One is we have to source healthy food collectively. We need to use that collective leverage, that six to $12 billion leverage that bodegas have with the wholesale food suppliers. <clears throat> and we have to create a last mile distribution channel that can deliver to bodegas multiple times a week, lots of small orders, very nimbly, and do it in an affordable way that allows us to get fresh and healthy food into the store on the corner that people go into every day and get it to them at competitive, affordable prices. We believe it's possible. I've talked with um, companies that do food distribution, produce distribution. I've talked with a very cool operation in Kansas City about how many deliveries can you do a day? What does it cost? You know, how long does it take to, to stop, do a delivery to a store, do the in-store merchandising and so on? We're looking at all of these little pieces of how to make this work, and we're convinced we can do it. <clears throat> so my last slide is this, which is, this is what we're working on right now. We've chosen Hunt's point. The, the way this has to work is to do it in a, in a contained area. We want to not spend a lot of energy and money driving all over the city at this point. We're going to do it in one neighborhood. We chose Hunts Point. We'll offer bodegas healthy grab-and-go menu items. Sliced fruit, which the kids on Saturday were universally preferring and loving. Um, 
we've had lots of, we've heard from Passaic, New Jersey. We've heard from San Jose, California. Um, we've heard from New York City in the Bronx, um, another initiative that Bronx Health Reach was involved in. Children will come in after school and they will buy sliced fruit instead of potato chips. They will, they do. Um, so we have sliced fruit, we're gonna have snacks, salads, sandwiches, not the full selection that we, you know, is our vision for the future, but enough to produce the data we need to show that this can work. And so we're looking at, as a business school, my part is the business school, we're looking at pulling together the data that says, we can use this financial leverage that the bodega sector has, six to $12 billion of buying power. We can use that and we can deliver to the stores multiple times a week and do it affordably. So that's what our pilot's about. And um, that's just the background. Thanks, Chet. Yeah, thanks for giving us that overview here. So the, the taste testing that Chet was referring to um, from Saturday, that was with the Hunts Point Alliance for Children. They had a big back to school event. And we had uh, Latoya from Collective there provide some of her um, tasty options for people to see if they like. So um, Latoya, if you can tell us a bit about um, your work with Collective Fair, um, what is the organization? How did you decide to create it? Um, what do you wanna see come out of this collaboration in the Bronx and Hunts Point? Absolutely, hi, thank you for having me, Kelly. Um, so Collective Fair started as a, uh, started as Southern Ethos, which is a, uh, a food consulting company, which, which we were looking to enable, uh, empower BIPOC um, food operators to create profitable um, restaurants and food service industries, uh, food service establishments inside underserved communities. Uh, that whole project led us to create a 10-week culinary training program along with another nonprofit and launch said program. Uh, in the midst of running that program, we, uh, we created to cre keep the nonprofit sustainable, we created a catering company um, at, at, under this um, facilities so that we could help the people in the community create another revenue stream and as well as a nonprofit stay afloat. Um, of course, the pandemic hit, things went a little haywire in the food industry. Uh, and that's when Collective Fair, Collective Fair was born like six months earlier. Um, Collective Fair literally started out as a, as a uh, full service hospitality company with a culinary education uh, focus. So what we would do is we would bring in participants in our program, train them how to run a catering company, find, um, my job was to really find the, uh, do what I do best, which is find sales and find places to market their talents and help them create sustainable business. Uh, during the height of the pandemic, uh, we pivoted, we were in, we were located in Brownsville at the time. Uh, we saw the impact of what was going on. So if you've never seen a food desert, imagine that under even more duress during an entire shutdown of, of New York City. Um, this experience, what we experienced during the pandemic has literally um, had a, a really has really informed the way that we've been driving Collective Fair and even the launch of our nonprofit Collective Food Works, which was launched uh, in 2020. Um, Collective Fair now is still a food service, a full service catering company. However, we have two storefronts located, one in located in um, Clinton Hill, Collective Fair Kitchen and Market. Um, and then we also have another one located in Cypress Hills um, called uh, Collective Fair Cantina, which is uh, built inside of an affordable housing development, uh, which we made recommendations to show how do we how we can create uh, a sustainable um, farm to table uh, meth, uh, market inside. I'm, I'm sorry, farm to table um, sort of system inside of an affordable housing development. So they have a rooftop farm, they have an incubator kitchen, entrepreneur space, and then there's the cafe that is operated by Collective Fair. Why do I do what I do? Um, the reason why we do what we do is because we realized um, the only way to help the community uh, empower itself is to educate, is through education. Um, 
we saw during the pandemic a great many things. Uh, one thing is that not that people, not that there is limited access, but also there's limited education. Because if I give you a butternut squash and you're not informed on how to break that down, then we're dealing with uh, food going to waste. If you're not understanding how to cook or prepare it so that it's delicious and tasty. Now we have um, a different a different idea about how that, what that food should taste like. Um, we focus on how do we create mindset changes as well as um, having people understand that cooking techniques make the difference on how you would enjoy, like uh, Chet said, uh, the oyster mushroom hummus versus a regular old, regular chickpea hummus, which most, most people are accustomed to having. We also focus on, on um, culturally relevant food. Um, we realize that when you are in smaller in, in communities, um, it's one thing for like a bodega to have uh, the food items. Well, let me, let me, let me put it this way. Um, you start to see changes in communities once communities start to become gentrified. But how do we create those changes immediately? How do we begin to build better food ways for our community members so that they're making healthy choices. And I feel that bodegas are the, are the best business platforms in our communities to create that change. Um, there's some communities that only have, that, that don't have access to supermarkets and they only have bodegas. So bodegas are essentially the community food hubs in those spaces. Um, I know that the Bodega Association, they're working on a great many projects and um, they are very adamant at creating this, these safe spaces for people to be able to come and purchase healthy food and empower our bodega owners to be able to offer healthy food. The type of products that we sell through Collective Fair are all around um, seasonal fresh, uh, fresh and seasonality. We have, um, because of our nonprofit, we launched a farmer's market called Greens and Things. This is actually a project that started during um, the pandemic. Uh, we worked along with several other organizations and we launched a CSA bag program. Uh, the bag was the bag retailed for $7 EBT or SNAP or $10 cash. Every week, the bag was curated with a myriad of different items, um, even some obscure things like kohlrabi or sunchokes. And then it came with a recipe card. And we started to canvas and survey the community to find out what was what, why would why was this bag being so well well received? And the reasons being is that they love the the connection to the recipes. They love the connections to having a, the items that they don't necessarily see in their community, but also the education that was going on behind it. So we found that that that, that this uh, initiative was something that was extremely viable, and it's been something that we've been continuing to 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 to, um, to this day. Thanks, Latoya. Did you have anything else you were going to share? Yes. Okay. So the the food the food that we cure that we um that we that we curate for our menus is either bought from our farm partners, or even if we are doing so on the what we do is during farmers market season, we also rescue produce from uh, various farm stands that are, you know, they have an excess of produce. So what we do is we rescue those. Actually, we actually pay the, the, um, the farm vendors a uh, minimal price, and then we redistribute that food at a, at a, in bulk to our community. Um, why we do this is because one, we're realizing that there's a lot of food that's going to waste, but we're also realizing that uh, there's not a, a lot of farmers markets in underserved communities. So to be able to open up a small scale farm stand and allow people to purchase uh, farm fresh food at really affordable prices is something that uh, has been extremely, it's been um, a viable initiative. Um, and what do I wanna see come out of the collaboration of the bodegas and small business group? I really think that leaning into empowering bodegas is the right way to go. Um, like for instance, uh, Chet had the slide up of Hunts Point. You know, it's it's heartbreaking to find out that Hunts Point is an underserved community dealing with food scarcity when literally the largest food depot in New York is located in Hunts Point. So if that's where, if that's where all of our food is coming in from, then you would only think that it would be the food the food would be able to be distributed into these communities. But there's a break in the system, 
And that's what I, um, my team and I are looking forward to working along with um, NYU, uh, Bronx Health Reach, and various organizations to help solve these problems and just create some really delicious and healthy options for our communities. Thanks, Latoya. It's really exciting um, that you have this business and that you know we're connected to you now. Um, I think it's thanks to Chet and Divya at NYU for getting us connected to you. So thank you both. Um, so I want to move on to um, Francisco Marte or Frank from the Bodega and Small Business Group um, to tell us more about you know what what are the qualities that you look for in a bodega that makes them um, successful at selling healthy options that can make them successful in this pilot? And then what kind of partnerships do you hope to see bode between bodegas and the community? Hello, uh, you can hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, well, what we need first is to educate our bodegas owners. Um, in order that we can sell on offers on the healthy products. We've been doing that even when we start to recreate the, the healthy bodega with um, Bronze Health, um, uh, Health Rich. Um, now we're working with, uh, with Stern and Chess and um, the collective. That's what we need to work, to, uh, we need to work together. But we have to understand that for bodegas to offer the healthy option, we need first, we need to educate the, the bodegueros. We need, the, the product has to be profitable because the store, uh, we have a lot of expense. So we have to um, market um, what we are offering because we're gonna fight against the giants, those corporations that they, uh, they sell and promote um, the, the salty and sweet uh, products. Um, they invest a lot of money on, uh, to promote that. So that's what we have to to work um, on to keep on to keep um, educating, talking to our bodegas. We gotta make a partner, and I believe that um, bodega and small business group um, have the capacity to bring all of the bodegas together, talk to them, and let them know how important are um, to work with the community. I don't want that to leave the bodegas out or blame the bodegas. Sometimes, like uh, the, we are the the store that we are selling the junk food. No, we just are a business that we be offering the most popular stuff, but we want to work to offer the healthy uh, option because we know the problems that we be having, uh, especially in the Bronx with, uh, with the high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity. And we want to work, and we want to work um, um, together and educate, but we need to have the facility how to make all of those um, options that can be profitable for the store, we need to go to the store to talk to to see how we can promote a putting on the on the place uh, how we can offer to the to the customer make it more easy to the customer or even to approach i have a, a good experience on this um when we start the, the healthy programs i had a customer that he always go to the store to buy bacon egg and cheese which is a delicious sandwich but it's not healthy and i told him once that he should um Interact sometimes with uh, with the uh, um, turkey, lettuce, tomatoes, by um, natural juice, or or, or, or a, a water when he buy the bacon and cheese. The next day he came and he asked me um, that he wanna try the the turkey, turkey and lettuce, tomatoes. Um, he bought a juice, natural juice. So we need to integrate our bodegueros. We can make uh, the the huge uh, in, influence in our community, because we know our customer, but we need to have that option and we need to make profit because we have so much spend. Um, and I know that with, with, um, with the, all of the organization, but this is basically more in education, not only to the bodegas owner, but we need to work with all of those um, organization, uh, faith-based um, organization with the school. We need the somehow to bring that information to the school, to the kids, to the parents. When they do uh, some teacher meet or something like that, we need to, to talk um, about how important is the health um, food for our community. Um, we have the, the bigger markets right here at Hunts Point. Well, let's take an advantage. Let's see them find a way how we can have um, to offer the healthy option 
to our community in form more economical or with a better price. Um, we need some maybe uh, some coupons for the community so that they can be used at the bodega. So the bodega can use and can sell them the the products, uh, the healthy products, and the the community can use those coupons that they use sometimes on the farmer. But the farmer is only open one day a week, and sometimes they are far from the from the main community. So we need some type of those programs to come to the store also that we be able to accept those coupons and offer the, um, the community um, those products. We, the bodegas are the best place to make this to, uh, to work and to have a better food for our community, to help to teach our community how they can eat. It's not easy to change the habit of the people eating what they eat, but together, all of talking about the importance of being healthy, we can help. So we here at the Bodega, the small business group, we here to, to do whatever we have to do to help our community. We are within the community and we want to be part um, integrate of the, our community in helping um, for, for the community to have a better health. Thank you, Frank. And yeah, there was a comment in the chat about um, about bodega box. And I know that you mentioned this, this idea of having, you know, consumer, you know, coupons, right, that could be used in bodegas. And this has been an idea that's been around for a long time. I know that there was a pilot in a different part of New York City a couple years ago with bodega box. Um, it was with like paper coupons, though. And I, I know that, you know, if we're trying to keep track of this, you know, the sales of healthy items, um, it would be easier to do if it was, um, you know, systematized, right? And so we've talked a bit about the need for having a POS system in the bodega. Um, Frank, can you talk a little bit about the, the current um, sort of what's going on with bodegas? How many of them have POS systems? Um, what are the challenges to getting more of them to use it? And then the, the training, right? You have the healthy bodega training that we did with Bronx Health Reach. Yes, um, yes, those was um, those training that we did uh, with healthy bodegas and 911, that is the, um, to educate the bodegas owner how to protect their license. Um, and the other um, with Bronx Health Reach and Mike, that he always be working with us, um, how to, to, to help the, the bodegas to, um, to have more products. And the POS, uh, before it was a big challenge because the, the bodegas feel like that was very difficult to, to work with, to learn how to, to maneuver the, the POS. Now we are uh, promoting, and I can tell you that almost half of the bodegas, they already be uh, having um, a POS. Um, I be telling them how important the POS is for to secure it, to not to lose the license, especially the food stand license and the PR license. And the people are understanding that we have to move forward with the technology. So now it's more easy. That's why I'm asking for if we can bring that program to work with the bodegas because um, a lot of bodegas, they already has a POS and almost all of the bodegueros that are willing to, to get in, even and we are doing it, uh, the bodega and the small business group, we are installing and offer them a free uh, POS um, to the bodegas, to the bodegueros, so they can understand, they can be more organized, like a step up for the bodegueros to be more organized and to work um, and offer any programs that have to be maneuvered through the POS system. So we're ready and we're working in that. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely an important, um, important project. Um, Chad and Latoya, do either of you have comments on sort of the logistics needed from a from a business perspective in these stores in order for the stores to be able to accept coupons if we were to get a program like that up and running? Um, actually, yeah, I think sort of leaning into into technology, I think would would be very useful. Um, yes, we understand that there are members in our community that, that don't, that have limited access to, um, limited access to technology. However, having a kiosk located inside of, you know, our small scale tablet located inside of our bodegas would help them, uh, get, uh, help them overcome any, um, learning curve to 
use either a Bodega Health Buck or it could be a membership card or any other thing that someone could um, could could utilize. Um, to Mike's point, yes, the, the being that bodegas are um, very uh, community centered, people are very trusting of them. So you're able to uh, you're able to to really uh, work on a myriad of different solutions for communities um, inside of the bodegas, as far as being able, having them be able to access um, additional resource, uh, additional like um, like you were saying, the bodega health box or health box in general, or EBT and SNAP or anything that they would need. Thanks. I want to thank Latoya for what she's doing is because that's what we need. Someone that believe and that, that um, uh, and create some products to offering in our store. And that's something that um, I hope that we can develop and we can get more people like Latoya um, bringing more healthy products. And we can work together and offer to our community. And little by little, teach them how important it is um, to be healthy. Thank you, Latoya. Jeff, do you have anything to share? Yeah. No, I think Frank and Latoya are, are, are much better at, you know, talking about the, the logistics of coupons and so on. We, we, we know that we have to stimulate demand, not just put food in the store and expect people to find it. Um, and coupons are a really good way to do that. Um, I'm not sure if we can force store owners who don't use POS systems to use them, um, but we're really relying on, on the bodega group uh, and bodega owners to, to tell us how to make that work. Um, Chess, I know if we can get those programs, I will do the, I will do the work how to convince and to show them and educate them how to use uh, the, the POS and how convenient is for, for, the, for them to use a POS. Yeah, I see, I see Teresa has some comments in the chat about WIC. And I know that this is a really um, important program because there are nutrition standards for the foods that are part of this program that are sold in the stores. Um, Frank, what's been your, what's been your perspective um, with the stores that are using WIC? Um, you think it's a successful program or any challenges there? Yes, it's a successful uh, program, but it's too limited. Not um, too many stores, they have the, the, the programs and um, beside that um, they use some trick to to find the store uh, who has uh, the license so many stores even a uh, small bodega they have turned back the, the license but now with this with the system they are now applying again for that it's a nice and good uh, programs uh, because um, it provides our customers they don't have to go too far but um, we need um, we need more store to apply for the programs and now with the POS, so in that way we can all get those hefty fines that sometimes the store for any mistake that they make, they gotta pay 20, 30, 50,000. Know, I know people that have paid fifty thousand dollars in fines, so they abuse um the system abuse on time. Uh, that was at one point we were told that that there was some plans that the big box store were having. And when the way so the bodegas could lose all their license because that was a trick that the, the, the inspector was using it. So in order um they can be just using the big box store. So now with with the POS and the education that we are uh, giving to the store owner and telling that through the system is more easy uh, because you just qualify whatever is the barcode say. So that's a nice program. Yeah, the week is a nice program. We just need to to work more together with them, with the agency, uh, as well as with the food stand also. We need to educate the, the bodegas owner and tell them what they exactly, how they exactly have to work with the program because that's what sometimes happens. They don't give you a training. They send you a lot of bunch of paper on email, which most of the time we don't read it. So we need to, to give you training. And that's why we are trying to, to get to bring more training for the bodegas owner. Right. Yeah. No. Oh, go ahead, Teresa. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious um, whether 
Francisco, if you're finding it easier, I know WIC has a lot of regulations and it's and it is really hard. Um, and hopefully the bodegas um, benefited when the food package changed in 2010. And hopefully within the next year or so, it'll change again to have more and more healthy foods. But since we have eWIC cards and since we have an app, which I didn't mention, I was just rushing through getting information, but we also have a WIC to go app. So the participant could take their phone and scan a food item and find out if it's a WIC eligible food item. Do you find that it's easier and maybe less penalties now? I'm hoping you do. Yes, yes, yes. It's less penalty because like I told you, some bodega, they just turn back the, the license. And now the, the one that, that still has it or they have applied for, they go through the POS system now. And that's what we call that we call it for more uh, educate. We need to educate our bodegueros because for you to have a bodega, what you need to have, a, you, have you need to have some money or to have credit or get a space, apply for that, but you don't need to be educated, but we really need to educate them in order for them to save and not to work with the different programs. Now we are losing this and they, they, those programs, they just be going to those big box store, which they don't service the community because they are not there when the community need it. When you are in emergency, you can run inside the bodegas and you'll be safe. Or you can go and ask for the bodeguero to give you something on credit until you get paid and the bodega will do it. Those big banks, store, they don't do that. So they don't really serve the community. We serve the community because we help their community. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm, I know I, I don't wanna take your time, but um, I know there are regulations and it's hard. And I know that we can't let you um, you know, not charge or give credit or whatever. When I was a kid, I used to go around the corner and get food. We always had credit, a whole long list from my mom, but that was a long time ago. But I am hoping, I just think it's such a good marriage. Um, at least the bodega, if you're doing the bodega project and doing a healthy shopping, shop healthy NYC or whatever, if we already, if you take at least some of the WIC contracted bodegas because we focus on healthy foods and then we're sending people your way to want to buy these healthy foods because they get it for free from WIC you know it, it's it's different than like years ago we wanted you to have whole grains and whole grain breads and, to, and it never left the shelf low fat milk no one bought it but now they have to you know so I, I would like you know, Kelly, I can have a further conversation with you to find out which stores. I just think it's a good marriage, even if it's not only with contracted stores. But I think it's a, I just think it's a great start. Teresa, I really uh, love you, can, uh, you can help us to keep doing this more program and educate more business owners because um, we need that. Uh, we need our store in the in the in the, uh, in the corner store with our convenience store. We need to be there to help the community remember that during the pandemic with the whole city shut down, we okay. stay offering helping our community. And um, we deserve to help our bodegueros educate. That's what we need, educate the, the bodegueros. If we educate them, they will know then how to really use those um, uh, permits, those licenses that they use. It, those you know, the, the um, beauty of I'm sorry, Latoya. No, check. go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, the beauty of creating a, a healthy food distribution channel through bodegas is bodeg bodegueros are, are people from the neighborhood. Um, you know, as they succeed there, you know, the, 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 um, the profits, the wealth that's generated remains in the neighborhood and gets recycled into jobs, into, into, into successful business people there. It's not getting sent to to Walmart headquarters in, in Arkansas, you know? And so that's a beauty of the Bodegueros. And that at the same time, we have to remember, you know, these are entrepreneurs, you know, where, you know, dad works from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And then his son works from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. And they don't have, you know, they should follow the regulations there, you know, but, but there is a, often a, a very um, antagonistic relationship with, regulators who come into the stores it's not a helpful relationship it's more of an antagonistic relationship 
And um, that's something that needs to be fixed. Yeah, oh, go ahead, Latoya, did you wanna go first? I was gonna say that to talk about what, what Teresa's as far as WIC, um, I think one of the biggest issues we have with bodegas is purchasing power, right? Because if, as per the WIC program, one, knowing what exactly what is allowed for bodegas to purchase, and then looking at those items that are traditionally going to big box stores, how do bodegas create a, a better purchasing power so they can get the, you know, the those same items that are usually very uh, much more expensive? How do they get those at, a, at a, you know, affordable, affordable prices? I think it's important for bodegas to be able to stock these things in their shelves. However, they if, if they can't because of their being priced out, how do we begin to make a structure that allows for the bodegas to be able to stock these items so that they can fulfill um, so that, you know, a young mom could have, you know, WIC, WIC enabled items right in, right around the corner from her rather than go into a big box store or a supermarket in the neighborhood. No, I agree. I, you know, you guys could call me. I could hook you up with our the uh, vendor management organization. I know it's hard because believe me, I'm under... I'm under them too. They come and investigate me too. And, you know, so I, I get it. And it, and the only way we improve is if it's not an adversarial relationship, if we work together to try to achieve our goals. And it is important that the right foods are sold, you know, because that's what makes WIC WIC, you know, like you're not buying fruit punch. You're buying, you know, real juice and we're trying to lower the amount of juice and increase fruits and vegetables, by the way. But, um, you know, I could put my contact information in the chat and let's see if we could do something. I, years ago, I used to contract with our, for me, it was all bodegas. So with our bodegas and I used to train them, they have a different system now but I still um, can make some connections and have conversations and maybe that's helpful. The bodegas are very important to our families. Uh, most of my people, I don't think they go to the big box stores. They just like, they like their family doc, they like their family grocery. You know, they feel good about that. So I'll put my contact information in here just in case. Thanks, Teresa. And yeah, just to re reiterate with this project, what's unique about it is that we're really looking to be able to take advantage of bulk purchasing. Um, you know, I know that some people in the chat have mentioned about the, the Shop Healthy program that the city has done, um, you know, to, to train bodega owners to stock some healthier items. Um, but without actually looking at the supply chain, we're not making it so that the bodegas can be um, competitive in the same ways um, as the big box stores. So, you know, by doing the bulk purchasing, um, we'll be able to make those prices more affordable so that the stores can stock them on a more regular basis and, and find the right price point. Kelly, um, what they do yeah. in WIC though, is they have groupings. So they don't compare the prices of a bodega to Walmart. They compare, um, they do, price grouping so they're comparing it to bodegas um they do have a, a system to do that you know but there's always better ways to do it you're talking about for the WIC purchases for WIC, or? For WIC purchasing mm -hmm. okay yeah we're just talking about for like healthy general. foods in general yeah. um yeah um Chet do you want to talk for a few minutes about the role of this operations manager that we're envisioning that would help to like figure out the the day to day work and find the right price point that's going to work for the community members for the bodegas and for the distributors. Sure. Um, so one of the things that we learned talking with people who have run other healthy bodega programs is that you can't just assume you're going to take some produce or grab and go items any 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 new new products that that are not in the store yet and drop them on some store's doorstep and send them a bill you know it's not going to work um there was some good info you know some some people were mentioning in the chat about um transforming storefronts um there's been very interesting work around transforming bodegas 
Um, Los Angeles has a, hum a, a complete makeover project that they do. Um, that doesn't seem doable on a mass scale to me, but, but certainly helping bodegas merchandise healthy food better, um, you know, making sure that it's rotated, that everything that's there is fresh, that it looks good, that it's up front. It's the, and when the Pepsi guy came in, he didn't cover him with potato chips. That's important. And we know that we can't assume that the bodeguero has time to take care of that or has the knowledge, at least at the beginning, to take care of that. So our operations manager is somebody who is going to be involved with both when the food is delivered, merchandising it, taking back what's no longer good, um, finding out what the, what people have been saying to the store employees. You know, this isn't a project to take something that we think is perfect and test it. This is a learning project. So we want somebody who's going to be in the stores, talking to the store employees, talking to the customers, seeing what's being sold, and learning how to make this successful. Um, so the operations manager, which is what um, what we're calling this role, is uh, uh, you know somebody who's going to get down in the in the nitty gritty in the weeds and really understand um, what does it take to make this work. What do people, how do people respond? What do they respond to? What are they asking for? What are they asking not to have? Um, and so it's, um, it's operational in a technical sense, but it's also very, uh, a lot of soft, um, informal information about what's, what are people, you know, how are people responding in the stores? Um, so that's, that's the role we foresee as being critical to making this work. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I think Frank had something to add. Yes, um, that I believe the operation management should be come from the bodegas because I uh, have to be someone that really knows how to approach the bodeguero. The bodeguero feel comfortable to talk, to answer questions, and that we know what we are doing, what work, what has been working in my bodega with the experience that I, I've been doing or how it could work in this neighborhood. So, um, I believe that the bodegas, um, the bodegueros, we can manage the programs and making um, successful together with with uh, with um, our partnerships, chess, uh, bronze house, and the uh, collective. Yeah, we're really looking at this. This is a very collective project, in <laughs> order collaborative project to, to make it happen. Um, Latoya, a couple of weeks ago, I know that you mentioned um, with Collective Fair, the you know that you saw some some kids in the neighborhood, and I think there was a bodega that had shut down, and they didn't have anywhere to get their their snacks in the morning, and you you created an option. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, so I'm going to preface first with um, we are not a we are not an official bodega. Uh, bodegas get are officially they get a um, we are a restaurant. Uh, but we are a, t a takeout restaurant. That's our model at our collective, uh, collective fair kitchen and market. Um, however, there was a bodega around the corner. Her name was Lisa. We all, everybody in the community loved her. However, there, you know, with rising rents, uh, there's a lot of issues going on with landlords and tenants and so on and so forth. She had to close. Um, the reason why this was important is because she, uh, she offered uh, low cost um options for students to have breakfast. So she made empanadas that she sold to the students for a dollar or two dollars rather. Um, you know, of course, they're traditional bacon, egg and cheese, but also the kids would load up on snacks or whatever they want um, at, at the store. So her closing was a complete detriment to the, to the students in the neighborhood. Um, we're currently, like I said, we're located in Fort Greene. So price points for our students aren't um, according to like what they, you, you, students are not going to be able to spend $5 a day on food uh, in our neighborhood. So they need this, you need, they need even more affordable options. So what we did is uh, traditionally we were opening from like 11 to seven for lunch. We pivoted and we, oh, we're now opening from seven to seven. So 7 a.m. We created a product called Collective Pockets, um, which is a crispy, like a crispy wonton similar to an empanada. 
Uh, we fill it with uh, mushroom chopped cheese, uh, all different types of delicious fillings. Uh, we sell them to the students for about $2. Um, so we literally have a great, we've created great options. And then on top of that, we do fresh fruit trays. We do um, other items that allow for the students to come and grab and go because the school is right down the block. And we also are surrounded by three other colleges. Um, I forgot to also mention one of the premises for us opening Collective uh, Kitchen and Market is we're focused on how do we create affordable op affordable healthy food options um, within, within uh, communities. So our store is really... We, we leverage it as like a catalyst for change. We look at how do we, like, what are students, what are their price points? What can they afford? And then what kind of food options can health, healthy food options can be uh, provided for them? Um, if you come down to our store anytime, you'll usually see a bunch of kids or a bunch of college students. And uh, that's just the way we like it. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential with, um, you know, helping to shift some of the the youth purchasing in the neighborhoods. And um, I think that there's some interest um, with people who work with the schools, right, with, with seeing how we can partner and get some of the kids eating healthier options. Um, so to, to that point, Kelly, um, I typically tend to, so part of coming into the community, I make myself, my presence known to various schools. Uh, and the colleges, and we talked, I literally asked them, like, what are, what are some of their needs? Uh, because college students deal with food scarcity, you know, you're paying tuition, you're studying, you don't have a lot of access to food, and usually, uh, you know, you don't have a lot of access to money, so how, what, but usually the food that they can afford is food that is not so healthy, so how can we make those changes there, and then, uh, of course, our high school students, um, there are, oh, hey, guys, <laughs> that's the college, that's the school students. Um, they, um, they are very limited on funds as well because, you know, they don't have jobs. So how do, how do we create affordable options for them that are delicious and nutritious? Um, and then you have some schools that the kids don't like the school lunch, right? We can talk about that all day. So how do we, again, think about how do we, how do you, how do we become that catalyst for change, but also, uh, uh, um, enabling the students to be able to get really, really great food uh, so they can have nutrition, you know, throughout the day. Yeah, we had a um, curriculum a couple of years ago as part of the campaign that Bronx Health Reach and other groups in the Bronx were involved in called Don't Stress, Eat Fresh. And we had a curriculum um, that uh, one of our partners, um, and I think we, we might have had some interns um, going and teaching the kids in the school um, you know, at, usually in after school programs, right, to, to think about how they can ask for healthier foods from their local bodegas. Um, so it's something I think we can um, consider, you know, for the future for this new pilot, um, as we look to find the, you know, the, the sweet spot between what the customer wants, the bodegas are able to sell and what the distributors are able to provide. Um, and so I do just want to put it out there for anyone um, listening that we are looking to identify specific bodegas in Hunts Point um, to participate in this pilot um, or that we, you know, Bodega and Small Business Group can go to and, you know, identify if, if they would be a good candidate. Um, but we want these, these options to come from the community, you know, because we want to build it up from the community demand side. Um, so I just want to put that out there for anybody that is working with schools and wants to collaborate with us on this, on this project. Um, and so I, I guess if, if people want to start putting any additional questions in the chat, um, we do have some time for, for more questions. Um, and I did want to invite, um, I know two other people who have been part of this, um, this project with us are, are Divya from NYU and then uh, Julia Mayer with the Bodega and Small Business Group. Um, not to put you on the spot or anything, but if either of you want to add to the conversation, um, feel free to do that as well. Thanks, Kelly. Happy to uh, wait for, for questions and uh, hear the rest of the room. Yeah, and I, I just want to thank everyone for, for their very thoughtful comments. So we would definitely like to pursue working with all of you in the future in more detail. Um, I, I just want to also say that 
the Bodega and Small Business Group, we started working with Bronx Health Reach several years ago when they got their first REACH grant. And, and we were very fortunate that uh, Bronx Health Reach was open to us because we came in and said, we want to try a different idea for working with bodegas. We want bodegas, bodegas want to be part of the solution, actually, to, to paraphrase what um, Vanessa Gibson said earlier, we don't want to leave our children and our elderly and our communities behind. Uh, we want to find a way to move forward. And um, Bronx Health Reach was uh, willing to work with us to, to help to let us create a business focused training for the bodegas that was culturally, linguistically, and operationally tied to their day to day operations. And so when Frank is talking about that training, uh, we have two trainings. One is Healthy Bodega, which covers everything from how to sell healthy options to the regulatory issues and how to avoid fines. And we also run a, a training called Bodega 911, which is basically focused on EWIC and SNAP, which again focuses not only how to sell effectively, but also how to do that at a reasonable price point, how to merchandise, and also how to deal with the regulations that threaten the bodegas. So I, I want to just mention that because it is very, very important that um, the training that we're working with has been developed by bodegas in association with health organizations. And we would like to expand that and work with many more people um, to, to help to train the bodegas. So, so that's one point. And then the second point that we talk about all the time is how do we really reach children? Um, as Frank and as many people have mentioned, you have Coca-Cola. Uh, I probably shouldn't say the names of the various evil empire um, groups, but we have many large marketing organizations that promote heavily um, a, a variety of products that are not good for our kids. And yet at the same time, it is a real challenge to attract children, to get children involved and engaged, and to see that that you know, healthy products can be cool. Uh, they can make you strong. They can let you play soccer. They can let you be a dancer. Um, there are many things that can we can do. So, so again, we want to stress the future, not just working with parents, but really how do we appeal to children uh, as we move forward in Hunts Point and with bodegas across the city and with other organizations. So thank you. Thanks, Julia. And there was a question earlier in the chat about the licenses. What is the cost of the licenses? I know that's a big, um, you know, challenge sometimes for the bodegas that have all these licensing fees, and that's what the bodega training is supposed to help to address. Uh, there are three bodega licenses that the stores have to have: Ag and Markets, their um, uh, C20 license. Those are not especially expensive licenses. What, what we find is the issue is that, again, the training is not operationally targeted towards the bodegas. Again, there's a disconnect. The information is critical and essential because bodegas get fined severely if they don't follow and meet those regulations. However, the gap is, even though there are great websites in Spanish, the gap is the training has to be done from the bottom up as well as from the top down so that um, the store owners understand the, the very minute details of how to be successful in dealing with the, with the licenses and fulfilling the obligations of the licenses. Uh, we had proposed at one point uh, another license, which is kind of a political hot button, but that license would uh, be a bodega license that did not have uh, consequences for losing your license. But, but in order to have the license, you had to take a uh, training that really in depth helped bodegas understand how all the licenses work together, how to work with those regulations and how to be more successful, as well as to sell healthy options. And that, that license would be very inexpensive. Uh, again, I it's not an exact price point, but let's say $250. Uh, 
Uh, but what's most important about that license would be that working with the major agencies, we would forgive the first fine um, uh, so that the price equaled out. And then you would have to take those some kind of remedial training to make sure you understood the principle as long as the fine was not a felony. If it was a, an error, a problem, a, a mistake, a not understanding what you needed to do properly. So um, I, I hope that answers your question. But in general, the licenses are required. There are three mandatory licenses. They're not expensive, but they're not integrated across day-to-day -day bodega operations. And that's what uh, Bodega and Small Business Group, that's what our training attempts to do. And again, we welcome working with these larger organizations to, in, to, to be able to deliver our training and to be able to work with the organizations to adapt their training for bodegas as well. Thanks, Julia. Um, and the, yeah, so Teresa put a question in the chat about the, um, the youth photos. So we did a youth photo voice project some years ago um, where the kids went in, they took pictures of the food in their neighborhoods and they wrote little um, blurbs about it. So I remember, I don't know, one of one of the ones that sticks out in my mind is like there was some sort of like you know cut through in like a styrofoam package of plastic on top of it and there was like a fly stuck in it <laughs> so that was like that was one of the ones that i remember but um i don't i don't remember what particular type of uh food retail outlet that was but um yeah there's there's a lot to there's a lot to do there's a lot of creative ideas out there in terms of um you know getting youth involved there was that youth photo voice project um social marketing campaigns. I know um, there was some bodega work involved with um, this project we did a couple years ago on, on youth food counter marketing. Um, mm -hmm. And we had the Center for Urban Pedagogy um, partner with the kids um, at CMSP 327 over a summer. It was a um, new settlement apartment school and they, um, they had them go and they, you know, it, they, they did some really creative things with, you know, making the um the contrast between the the healthy and, and the unhealthy foods available um in the stores to make the point so you know it's just about getting kids involved but they can be really creative um you know once we frame the issues to them um let's see what else anyone else have any questions we have a couple more minutes here any other questions or comments about healthy bodega initiative If not, I think we can, um, oh yeah, there is a comment in here about the predatory um, predatory food marketing. So yeah, um, they spoke earlier, I think um, Senator, when Senator Rivera spoke and then um, Deanna from Center for Science and the Public Interest spoke about the Predatory Marketing Prevention Act um, that Senator Myrie is sponsoring. Um, and I think it's all related, you know, I think that you know, reducing the marketing of these unhealthy foods is also related to getting the kids to eating healthier options. You know, we have to make sure that they're educated about um, the healthier options and that they know what are the, the better options to select and why. Um, so I definitely think it's all related.